Let's turn in our Bible once again to Philippians chapter 1. Okay, Philippians chapter 1. We've already read the chapter. We got a little bit of an idea of what it's about. You know, when you look at these four chapters of uh, this book, I think that they're all about Jesus. And I think the big truth in chapter 1 is this. Are you ready for it? Jesus is the Christian life. Jesus is the Christian life. Let me put it this way. Christ died for you in order that he might live in you, that you may experience Jesus as your very life. I think that that really is the secret of human life. As Paul would say in Colossians, Christ in you. It, I think that it takes, it takes God in you to be the person that God intends you to be as a human being. It takes God in you to be that kind of, there, I don't think that a human life is complete without Christ in it. With Jesus in your life, you can only then reach the potential, the highest level of living that is possible, and you can do it without bitterness about your circumstances, because like Paul, who when he wrote this book was a prisoner for the gospel, you'll realize, you know what? My situation, God allowed this, and he's going to use it to further his plan and to make the gospel succeed and to exalt his name through his life in you. That's the point that I want you to get. Chapter 1, Paul is emphasizing the fact that Jesus not only lives in you, but he is your life. He is your life. You don't have a life. Get a life. Jesus' life is really what this chapter is about. And we'll see that as we get through it. But because Jesus is the life of the believer collectively, Paul talks about him being the life of the body of Christ. This is a body of Christ right here, gathered here this morning. People that are believers are part of the body of Christ. Bible pictures that for us in various scriptures. He's the head, we're the body. You're a part, I'm a part. Uh, we're a body part of the body of Christ. So as a whole, we make up the body of Christ. Look at how he puts it there in the first verse of Philippians 1. Verse 1, he names three on the missions team that he's uh, involved in, Paul, Timothy, uh, servants. Actually, he doesn't uh, name Silas, but we learned last week that in chapter 16 of Acts, Silas was also on that team there in uh, Philippi, and also Luke, because Luke says we, and he's the author of the book of Acts. And so, Here's a couple members of the missions team, Paul and Timothy, literally not servants, but the word in the original language is slaves, <laughs> slaves, Paul and Timothy, the slaves of Messiah, Jesus, of Jesus, the Messiah, to all the saints in Messiah, Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. So really, here we have a cross section of the body of Christ in that local uh, setting of the church at Philippi. The church, notice, the body of Christ is called saints. Are you with me this morning? You look like, some of you look like you're distant. You're, you're not here. Let's tune in. Don't get distracted. Uh, stay with me. Uh, the Lord wants to speak to us. So Paul says that, the church, the body of Christ, are saints. Did you think that a saint was someone that died and then the Roman Catholic Church called, uh, you know, uh, called them saints because of whatever the qualifications are, I think a miracle or whatever? 
You know what the saints means? It means God's holy people. Remember this morning in the Haftarah? A holy man of God. Guess what the body of Christ is? They're holy people. Holy people are people that are set apart for God, to God and for God. That's all holiness is. It's a mark of distinction that you are not here for yourself and you are not here mainly for anyone else but God, holy people. That's what saints means. You're set apart to God for God. And that's what he calls the body of Christ here in Philippi. And that's what you are. If you're a believer, you are saints. You're holy people. That doesn't happen when you die. You're a saint now. You're set apart to God for God. Calls them saints. And then he calls himself and Timothy slaves, right? Servants or slaves. Isn't that interesting? That's not very uh exalting is it the saints and the slaves <laughs> they have different functions but they both belong to jesus but isn't it uh, significant that paul sees himself and timothy and the other members of this missions team as as not to someone up here and the the, the church down here he says, no, we're slaves of Jesus. And if you're a slave of Jesus, guess what? You're a slave of your brothers and sisters, too. Uh, if you're a slave of Jesus, you not only wash Jesus' feet, you'll wash any feet that he would lead you to wash. It's a humble position that he takes here as he talks about this body of Christ. But they are joined together, all of them. The bishops are simply overseers. You know, there are three main words in the New Testament to describe uh, uh, a position that I happen to be in. God put me in as pastor. I'm also called an overseer and an elder, all spiritual. They're, they, I think those terms are interchangeable for the same office and uh, for the same person. So bishops, really, it's the word overseers, and it talks about the the supervisory uh, function of the pastor of a church that we have the responsibility to watch over, to be an overseer, watch over the flock is what it's referring to. And of course, we know what deacons are. They're dusty servants, slaves. And so it's uh, they're joined together in a special uh, role, but yet very practical for fellowship. Now, let's look at this body of Christ and how Paul speaks to them. He says in verse 2, grace be unto you, peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And, it, and that's significant too, that grace precedes peace. It's, it's the grace of God that enables people to know the peace that God himself brings to the heart. And then he says in verse 3 through 6, he talks about his thinking, his mind. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Paul's thinking of that. He says in verse 4, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for the fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I remember the fellowship that we had from the beginning up to this present time. And I am confident, he says in verse 6, of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. How does Paul view the saints? How does Paul view this local church made up of overseers and deacons and uh, the saints? How does he view them? Well, he says, as a prisoner, I'm not thinking about myself, but I'm thinking about you all. And he says, and I remember, as I remember you, my mind is just flooded with the with joyfulness and thankfulness for the support that you. By the way, did you know that the book of Philippians is actually a thank you note written by this missionary for the financial support? 
that the Philippian church had sent to him already two times. And now the third time they sent a man uh, from their church called Epaphroditus. And uh, he brought their the third support check or whatever it was uh, to Paul and his missions team. And so Philippians is just thanking the Philippian church. But he gets into other things, of course, as well before he thanks them. But he's telling them how thankful he is for their support. And uh, then he says in that sixth verse, and we know this verse, we often use it. He, he is confident. He says, uh, it's evident that there is a continuing sanctifying work going on in you that I know God is going to bring to completion. And as a result of all of this, Paul says that he his mind in remembering them uh, causes him to just be filled with thanksgiving and joy. I wonder, is that how people think about you? Uh, when they when they call you to remembrance, when they have memories of uh, of you, does your life cause leaders cause the leaders in the church to praise God, to be filled with joy, to be thankful for you when they think of you? I hope so. I want that, don't you? I want people to be thankful and joyful whenever they have a memory of me. I don't want them to say, oh, no. I want to think about him. How does Paul view the body of Christ? Here's his mindset. He's joyful and he's thankful for them. Let's look into Paul's heart a little deeper. Verse 7, even as it is meat, he says, or right, for me to think this of you all, because here's why. I have you in my heart. I have you in my heart, even as uh, in as much as both in my bonds, he's talking about his imprisonment, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. For God's my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels. That's the compassion of Jesus Christ. So, how does Paul view the church, the body of Christ? They're in his mind, but here they're in his heart, which is evidence of really a sincere, deep bond of love that uh, is seen in his concern for them and his willingness to share God's grace with them. You know, when you are taught the word of God, when you are encouraged through the things that God brings to you, through uh, uh, various speakers, and you're you're they're sharing God's grace with you. They're sharing God's. We're sharing God's enable, uh, enablement with you. When Paul says you're partakers of my grace, you know what he's saying? He's saying everything that I do, as far as ministry is concerned, it doesn't come from me. It comes from God. And God enables me, and uh, and then I'm able to share God's enablement with you. And that's how he sees it, and that's the heart that he has for them, and a compassion that he expresses for them in that eighth verse, the body of Christ. Now, this guy's in prison. He doesn't sound like a hardened criminal, does he? Well, he's in prison not because he did wrong. He's in prison because he did right. He's in prison because he's preaching the gospel, and they want to shut him down. They, they don't want the gospel to go forth. And so he's in prison, but he's not hard. He, his, his mind is flooded with thanksgiving and joy about the, the body of Christ. They're in his heart and also in his prayers. Look at verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. Now, here's how a man of God views the church, views the body of Christ. The body of Christ, the church, it's in his mind. Uh, they're in his heart. 
but they're also in his prayers. Others are on the mind of a man that's in prison. Others are in the heart of a man that is in prison. Let me give you just a little advice. If you pray for people, they'll be in your mind. They'll be in your heart. That's how it happens. That's how comes he has them in his mind and his heart, because he's praying for these people, as he says in verses 9 uh, through 11. And what does he pray for them? Look at what he said here that we've just read. He prays for them in verse 9 that they would have an overflowing love towards one another, and also that they may approve things are excellent, verse 10, that they would have an increasing discernment about what's really important in the believing life. You know, that kind of discernment is really vital. Sometimes we major on the minors, <laughs> and we need to be focused on what's really important in the believing life. And that's what Paul prays for these people that they would be able to properly discern what's really important. So that then he says in verse 10, uh, 10 rather, you, you may be sincere. That is, it's actually a word that, that uh, pictures taking something like a piece of fine uh, pottery or china and, and holding it up to the sunlight uh, to see that there's no defects or cracks in it. Sometimes it's not visible until you hold it up to light. And so that word uh, without offense means sun judged. In other words, you, you've, you've, you've been put in the light and you've been tested and you've been shown to be not a crackpot. You've, uh, you've been shown to be real, genuine. And so he says sincere and he says without offense. And that word offense refers to a stumbling block, you know. Uh, to trip people up. He says, if you will be filled with love for the brethren that God wants you to give you, he wants to overflow you with love toward your, your brethren. And if you will have an increasing discernment of what's important in the Christian life, you're going to live a pure life and a life that will not cause others to trip to be tripped up by you. They'll see you walking in a straight path and uh, they won't be tripped up and, and your life won't be a stumbling block to them. And not only that, verse 11, you'll also bear spiritual fruit. You'll have a spiritually fruitful life that will bring glory and praise to God. And because Jesus is your life, the body of Christ shares not only that, but they share the same cause. And really, the rest of the chapter is not about the body of Christ, but actually the cause of Christ. <laughs> you know, there's only one cause that believers ought to get behind. There's a lot of causes. We get uh, all of this junk mail, right? And they want us to get behind their cause. It might be good causes, like the uh, American... Heart Association or the Cancer Society. There's a whole bunch of good causes out there, but ultimately there's only one cause that believers ought to get behind, and that's the cause of Christ. Let me tell you what I mean by that, because that's what the rest of the chapter, beginning of verse 12 on to the end, verse 30, is all about. And that is this. Here's the cause of Christ. You ready for it? The cause of Christ is God's eternal redemption plan that includes the spread of the gospel, that includes the Great Commission. And by the way, don't forget that the gospel is two-pronged. It's not only a gospel to sinners, there's a gospel to saints. The gospel to sinners, for example, is Romans 1 to 5. The gospel to saints is Romans 6 to 8. We just, we don't see the gospel as being full orb like that. We, we, we have like tunnel vision. Oh, when we hear the word gospel, we just think about winning souls. No, the gospel is both to the sinner and the saint. And so when we use that word gospel, we should understand 
It's the whole picture of discipleship. Discipleship is bringing people to Christ and then develop, uh, developing them in the life of Christ. So he's talking about uh, the cause of Christ here, giving success to the Great Commission, which is making disciples, and that is not only getting them saved, but teaching them to observe all things. That's the, that's the cause that you and I need to get behind 100%. And if you're not, then you're really not fulfilling the purpose. Christ is your life. And if Christ is your life, that's the cause that you'll be attacking. That's the cause that you'll line up on. That's the cause that will be uppermost in your thinking all the time. Now, the gospel, the gospel is proclaimed two ways. When we think about uh, the proclamation of the gospel, we think of the gospel preached by our lips, and that's true. That's one way, maybe a main way that we do it. Uh, look at what Paul says. Pick it up in verse 12. But I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me, what happened to him? He got arrested, right? He got arrested back in Jerusalem. And uh, that happens like, hmm, um, somewhere around chapter 21 of the book of Acts, and it takes the rest of the book of Acts. It's not till chapter 28 that he arrives in Rome, because remember, when he was arrested, uh, they gave him the opportunity to go back to Jerusalem and to be tried in front of the Jewish authorities, and he knew he wouldn't get a, a fair trial there. So he said, you know what? I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. I want to go before the Supreme Court in Rome. And so finally he gets to Rome in Acts 28, and he's under house arrest for about three years there. And what that entails is that he ha he's, he's in a place where he is under guard 24-7. Uh, but anyway, it's in that. That's what he's talking about when he says in verse 12, I want you to know that the things that happened to me, boy, he had a hard time getting to Rome, right? Even went to shipwreck before he got to Rome. Uh, but the things that happened to me, and now I'm a prisoner, though, those things, I want you to understand, they have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Wow, what an attitude. All that he went through. Now he's, he's, he's under arrest in Rome. He has no freedom, uh, in a sense. And, and yet his attitude is, I want to inform you about something. I'm a prisoner, but you know what? It's, it's okay. It's actually good because God has used this imprisonment to spread the gospel uh, in a way that it wouldn't be spread otherwise. He believed that all of his circumstances were meant to be used to advance Christ's cause. Is that what you believe? Now, I have to admit, <clears throat> there are times when I come in here, and I see the ceiling collapse because there's been a flood upstairs that uh, I have a hard time believing that that circumstance is meant to further the gospel. But you know what? Stupid me. God meant that to further the gospel. You know, because I, that puts me in contact with other people. And the way that I deal with them and my attitude towards them, if my frustration comes out, and it does, then that impacts others. And I don't further the gospel at times like that. Paul believed that all, cir all circumstances, even imprisonment, were meant to be used to advance Christ's cause because as a prisoner— it opened up doors of opportunity for gospel proclamation, a platform to reach lost souls that otherwise he would never be able to. For instance, uh, he says in this same passage, uh, verse 13, in my bonds in Christ there, there are manifest in all the palace and all other places in that city. The palace is actually a word that refers to the palace guards. 
They were called the Praetorium. They would be the equivalent of our Secret Service in Washington, D.C. These, uh, uh, these elite men guarded the imperial court, and, uh, and there was about 9,000 of them. And here's what happened. When Paul was put under house arrest, one of these, if not two of them, were actually chained to his wrist 24-7. They rotated. And, and so every guy that, uh, guard, that guarded Paul heard the gospel. They were a captive audience. They were chained to him, and he used that as opportunities to, and some of these secret service agents got saved. That's what he's saying here. They got saved, and the word got out throughout the whole city. God put him in the upper echelon as a prisoner to reach these people that otherwise would never even listen to him. And as a result, look at what it look at the impact it had on the body of Christ. When Paul sees the cause of Christ in the right light, then look at the impact upon the body of Christ. Verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my imprisonment, by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So it encouraged the church, their witnessing was emboldened by that. And so as a result, Paul says, you know what? I praise God for this trial. I'm thankful I'm in prison because look at how God's using it. He's saving not only the secret service agents, He's saving others, and the church is emboldened, and they're witnessing like they've never witnessed before. Boy, I wish I could have that constant viewpoint on trials that God brings in my life. Don't you? That we could see circumstances as a a reason to praise God, because even though we may not be able to figure it out at the moment, God's going to use this. God wants to use this. This is why it's so important that we have, that we're behind the cause of Christ and that we have this kind of mindset that we see this man have. So, and then he goes on to say, you know, yeah, there's been boldness in the church. Uh, They've been witnessing, but you know what? Some are preaching Christ for the wrong motive. Look at verse uh, 15. Some of them are preaching the gospel out of envy of me. And out of strife, and some also of goodwill. One preach, preaches Christ of contention, and uh, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and that makes me happy. I rejoice that the gospel's going forth. I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Now, what's going on here? Well, Paul must have intimidated some of the people and some of the leaders in the churches there in Philippi. And uh, so there were some that uh, they were preaching the gospel, but they were trying to outdo Paul. (laughs) They were jealous of Paul. They envied Paul. And so they did what they did to get one up on him, you know. And uh, But he says, it's all right. I don't care what their motive is. As long as the gospel is going forth, that's what matters, that the message is going forth. You know, we're not in competition here. Uh, it's okay. Uh, they may have evil intent in what they're doing, but, hey, the, the truth is going forth. Even though their hearts may not be right, the message of the gospel is going out. And he said, in, th- in that case, I rejoice. What an attitude. Whatever the motive, if the gospel's preached, praise the Lord for it, right? You know, we have problems. There's people that we don't agree with, but the gospel's going out. Well, praise the Lord if the gospel goes out, right? Even though they don't uh, cross the T and dot the I just like we do, If the gospel's going forth, well, then I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful the God, you know, there's people that uh, may be giving out tracts like like you do or uh, uh, speaking to people on the trains or whatever. And uh, they may be from a a different uh, 
church background altogether that we couldn't put our stamp of approval on. Hey, but they're preaching the gospel. Praise the Lord for that. And there are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that's that's Paul's point here. So the cause of Christ is to further the plan of redemption, God's eternal redemption plan by spreading the gospel, by giving success to the Great Commission. And that happens two ways. The gospel is preached by lip, as we just said. But secondly, and this is what really I think the rest of the chapter is about, the gospel is preached by life, by life. In fact, I really think that until you have the, the basis of a life, the gospel preached by lip doesn't have the power that it should. The gospel preached by life, there's two truths here. In verse 20, we pick it up, and Paul says, um, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness, as always so, now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or death. Uh, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, he, he means if I uh, my physical life is extended, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. I don't know whether I should uh, continue in this physical life or if... Uh, uh, I should go home to be with the Lord. He didn't know whether he was going to make it out alive or not. But he says this, verse 23, so I'm in a straight betwixt two. Uh, I don't care if I die physically uh, to, because I have a desire to be with the Lord. And by the way, that's that's important that you grasp that, that uh, – Physical death for the believer is simply to be with the Lord. It's to depart this life, but it's to be directly in the presence. No such thing as soul sleep, okay? The moment that you depart this life physically, you're in the presence of the Lord consciously. That's his point there. But he says, but uh, that's far better. Verse 24, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh, to be physically alive here among you is needful for you. And I have this confidence, verse 25, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of your faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Christ for me by the coming, by my coming uh, to you again. So two truths here in those verses that I've just read. It's the truth, again, that the Christian life is Christ. It's not only Christ, or the believer, rather, living for Christ, but it's that Christ is Paul's life, and he's supposed to be ours. And that Paul is not protecting his physical life because his physical life didn't belong to him. And life was not about him. It's just like we're told, you're not your own. And uh, all, all this physical life that we have, it's not about us. We make it all about us. We do what we want to do. But it's not, we're not here to take care of ourselves first and foremost. It's not about us. And we are not our own. And Paul understood that. And all I want to understand this. I want this clarifying truth in my life. Do you? That our life here on earth is for one cause, the cause of Christ. <laughs> our life on earth is to honor our Lord in every way, no matter what. So it doesn't matter what happens to me. <laughs> it might matter to other people, but in my heart of hearts, it can't matter what happens to me. I need to be ready to stay or go because I don't belong to myself. I don't have a say on what I think ought to happen. I'm not my own. It's not about me. It's all about the Lord. It's Christ in me. So I need to be ready to stay or go. Whatever you want, Lord, I'm ready. And that has to also 
apply to my family. I have to have that same attitude toward you as well. My physical family and my spiritual family. Yeah, we love them. We don't want we don't want anything to happen to the ones that we love, but hey, they don't belong to us. They're not their own. They're not ours. It's not about them. It's not about us. It's about God. If only I could get that truth cemented in my mind and live it all the time. Christ, that's what life is. It's him. It's his cause. It's his life. My life on earth has one purpose, and yours too if you claim to be a believer. You and I are here to honor the Lord. However he chooses to make that happen, we're here to honor the Lord. If it means, like it did for Stephen Trell, that we get to, that we get mowed down by a bullet and taken out of life, this physical life, early to depart and be with the Lord is far better. It hurts the family. Our life isn't ours. We don't get to choose. You need to be ready to go or ready to stay. Lord, what do you want? This is the mindset, and this is how you do missions. This is what missions is about. This is what ministry is about. This is what Christian living is about. We got it all messed up and backwards as, uh, as human beings, and even as Christians, we think it's about us. We think our life belongs to us. We think we're here for creature comforts. We're here to honor Christ, however he wants to do that. If he wants to take me out, if that brings him honor, that's his business. Glory to him. That's how we need to live our life. That's how Paul lived his life. That's the gospel preached by life, and it is that Christ is the Christian life. And that's all the Christian life is. It's Christ. And then look at how he closes it out. Here's the second way that the gospel is preached by the life. Not only that Christ is the believer's life, but in the last few verses of this chapter, see what it says there, only let your conversation. That word conversation is actually a political term. And it means live as citizens. But he's talking about living as not citizens of Rome, but as citizens of heaven. In fact, jump over for a moment to chapter 3 and verse 20. Same word for our conversation or political term again. Citizenship is in heaven, is in heaven. So the gospel preached by the life is a gospel that shows clearly our citizenship, that our first allegiance is not to any nation, be it the United States of America or the state of Israel or any country that you may hail from or your ancestors. Our first allegiance is not to any earthly nation, but to God's kingdom and to Jesus, who is your king. You have to be willing to suffer for your king, Jesus, here and now. And it's a privilege, Paul says, to suffer for your king because of your love for him. And you know that your present life is temporary and uh, your future life is eternal plus rewards. You know, I think about it whenever I see war. I think about, look at these. It, it, it happens in our wars. It happens in wars uh, in other countries, these soldiers are ready to defend their nation at any cost, even their lives. They're willing to <laughs> lay down their lives. How much more ought we to be ready to lay down our lives for and before our King Jesus? How, how is it that unsaved people can be so in love with their nation, can be so patriotic that they will throw themselves on a hand grenade in order to spare the lives of their fellow soldiers. 
and we are so self-protecting. It reminded me when I was thinking about this of an old gospel song that I heard years ago. I haven't heard it for years. And the, the title is, I'll wish I'd given him more. I'll, I wish I had given him more. You know, there's coming a day when before the Lord, it'll be too late to do anything for him. And we will, we will at that moment wish that we had given him more that we had given Jesus everything, that we would have not held anything back. I'll never forget my dad on his deathbed. I said, Dad, do you have any regrets? And he named some. But his biggest regret was that he didn't do more for the Lord, and he was in the pastorate for over 40 years in ministry. We're going to stand before the Lord as believers, and we are going to have deep regrets if we don't have that one cause that we're behind the cause of Christ. If we have put our time, energy, and money, and effort in other things, except the main thing, and that's Jesus, the one cause and the one body, that's what made this missionary Paul tick. That's what made him what he, what he is to us today because he was committed to that one cause. He realized that Christ was his life, and that was all that really mattered. And whatever Christ demanded from him, he would willingly give it to him. We live such superficial, foolish lives, don't we, compared to a man like this? It brings me to shame, you know, and <laughs> at the end of the day, when I do stand before the Lord, I, you know, that song, I wish I had given him more. You know what it says? It says, when I see his face, beautiful face, tear-stained face, when I see his hands, nail-riven hands, nail-scarred hands, I wished I'd given him more. Well, guess what? I don't know how much time you and I have left to give God more, but if we're ever going to give him more, it's got to happen now. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's got to happen now. You can't keep putting it off. You don't have any guarantee that you'll have more opportunity to give him more sometime in the future. It's got to start today. It's got to start now. You know, uh, some of us are up in age. We don't, we, obviously, I mean, just statistically, we don't have as much time as some of you others that are younger than us here today. But whatever time we have left, let's let's put it into that one cause, the cause of Christ. Let's make our lives count whatever number of years we have left on the planet. And it is a vapor, our life, right? It's so short. And the time is so desperate. And yet we just go along as if, you know, Ho-hum, the signs of the times are all around us. This whole world is spinning out of control, it seems, and God is in control. I understand that. But time's running out. How much longer can we pretend that we're going to do it someday in the future? The cause of Christ demands today, just as to a lost person, today is the day of salvation, today is the day of Whatever God wants you to do, today's the day. As they say, tomorrow never comes. It's called procrastination. I hate that about myself when I procrastinate things. Try not to. Bothers me. Procrastination bothers me when I see it in my children or whatever. Don't put it off. God wants you to go. Do it now. Don't wait any longer. Time's Running out. Clock's clicking. Yeah, we turn it back, but really, it's going. Going fast.